Today we're going to be looking at one of Fisher's most famous games, that is the game of the century. His opponent was Donald Byrne, and this game helped catapult the acknowledgement of Fisher's genius into the chess world. So without further ado, let's get into the game. It begins with knight f3, a ready defense. White does not commit a pawn. We looked over this in the Dutch defense video that I made prior. And here, Fischer responds with knight to f6. In theory, this is the best response to knight f3. Neither side commits a pawn. Neither side knows what they want to do in the... Or neither side is letting each other know what they want to do in the middle game. So we get c4. This is a transposition into the English defense. And Fischer goes for the kingside finchetto. Many of the times, he went into a king's Indian defense. So this is typically his most favorite opening. I would bet anything that had we gotten e4 he would have for sure gotten gone for the king's indian defense however we get bishop f4 and this bishop f4 line allows us to get into the grunfeld you could go into the grunfeld regardless it's slightly better to go into it when the bishop is on f4 leaving this diagonal allowing potential uh, great threats on the diagonal so we get a grunfeld and white plays queen to b3 this is known as the russian defense it's not so popular anymore but it is a sideline. Black takes, arguing that white's queen is slightly misplaced on c4. White is creating some threats on c7. You would not want to stop that with knight to c6. It would allow for full control of the center and then some not nice threats on c7. So we get pawn to c6, just defending against the threat. White still takes control of the center. And ironically, new theory suggests b5. I'm not a fan of this move. It creates a bunch of holes, ties down the knight. The idea is to expand on the queen side as black. And it's nice if white is not careful. If white is not careful, you can play b4, and all of a sudden, you will pick up this e4 pawn. However, white could guard against e4, and I'm just not a fan of this expansion. Computers do love their space, so understandable so. We get knight b to d7. I do like this move a lot. The knight can rotate over to the queen side. It creates, or it controls a lot of good squares, guards the knight. It's a very flexible move. And you know in the king's Indian, you get the knight on d7 a lot, blocking in the bishop. But the light squared bishop is known as the best piece in the king's Indian. So even though it is restricting the movement of the bishop, it is only temporary and not a problem at all for black. Rook d1, a nice move, just lining up with the queen, full control of the center. So white is doing well. Knight b6, gains a tempo on the queen, and at this point, they're still following theory. In all games, queen b3 is played, however, Byrne decides to go queen c5. Not so clear what the intention of queen c5 is, other than getting your opponent out of theory. It doesn't threaten too much, and in all honesty, it just looks slightly misplaced. Natural development move by Fisher, pinning the knight to the rook, and here, Byrne goes bishop g5, first mistake of the game. So here, bishop e2 for sure should be played. Cut the pin, get castled. You have some hanging pawns in the center. You can use those to your advantages, disadvantages if you blunder, of course. But yeah, bishop e2 seems pretty automatic. He goes bishop g5, trying to complicate the position, trying to get his opponent further out of theory. Just a game of pure calculation. Fisher was a perfectionist. Calculation was what he did best. So here he does play the move knight to a4. A beautiful move. Like you could imagine just like something h6 is played. It still looks like an opening. h6 does not look like such a bad move. You would just get a position that seems normal. You have the bishop pair. They have the center. Quite a balanced game. But his genius in just noticing to pause and realize, wait, okay, my opponent is moving the same piece twice, his queen is misplaced, I see that this is a fork, I would like to deflect the knight away from e4 with a threat, so it has to be dealt with, just, it's just like such a subtle position, so noticing that there's something there just proves his genius all the more. So, this knight was not taken, had this knight been taken, we would have gotten knight takes e4, forking the bishop and the queen. Not so many moves here for white. If they go queen takes e7, this would not be great. Black would play queen a5 check. You're, you can potentially line the rook up with the queen and the king. X-raying over to the bishop, pinning the knight and rook. 
attacking the other knight. This position is on the verge of collapsing for white. I think the better option would probably be bishop takes e7, but this just leads to a simplified position of knight takes queen, bishop takes queen, knight takes knight. White has to get the bishop to safety. You can even throw in a check as black, pinning the bishop. You can then collect a pawn. And after rook to b1, uh, bishop takes knight, let's say, pawn takes bishop, bishop takes another pawn. White's pawn structure is horrible. His king is tied down to his bishop on the e-file. And black is also up two pawns. So this looks crushing. So after knight a4, white retreats the queen to a3, and we get knight takes knight. Removing the knight, that was the point of knight a4 anyway, deflecting, trading, both do the job of winning the e4 pawn. Now, white does take the pawn on e7, forking the queen and the rook, and black has a decision to make. There's many good decisions here. It's actually crazy how good black's position really is. For example, you can even go queen takes bishop, and you're only slightly worse. So the fact that you can give up a queen for a bishop and only be slightly worse is pretty insane. There is much counterplay. I believe white's best move is queen c7 for reasons that are unclear. Queen takes rook, black would already have enough counterplay. So this is just a funny variation that just proves how good black's position really is. Fisher plays queen b6, obviously a way better move. The point of queen b6 is if bishop takes rook, bishop takes bishop, hitting the queen, gaining a tempo. It's not about piece count, it's about activity. Let's say the queen went back to guard c1, it does, or c3, sorry. It does not actually protect the c3 pawn. This could be taken, and after queen takes, if queen takes, there is bishop to b4. You could even throw in a rook e8 if you would like, and they block, and then knight takes c3. Same difference, very crushing position for black. Let's say they take and went queen b3. You can still take the pawn on c3. And even though you're trading and you're, you know, down material, not actually, because you just have so much activity, so much counterplay, a bishop and a pawn for a rook. And if you're saying this is the extra rook, uh, that is not an extra rook. That is a rook that is out of the game and not able to come into the game in time if black is playing actively. So after knight takes e4, we get bishop takes e7, queen b6. He then goes bishop to c4. He's like, okay, I got to get castled. Fisher now plays his second brilliancy, first one being knight a4, second one being knight takes c3. The point of this move, again, is a deflection. So if queen takes knight, rook e8, white would then castle, rook takes bishop. He probably should have gone for this. We have, black has a bishop pair and a better pawn structure, right? White has an isolated pawn and it's creeping towards an end game. Two disconnected pawns, black's pawn structure is perfect. Up a pawn, bishop pair. At the GM level, this is just like lost. So understandable why he did not go for it. He played bishop to c5, maintaining some pressure, some tension, and we get rook to e8 check. In between move, not allowing the king to castle, forcing the king to f1. Fisher now uncorks his third brilliancy, that is bishop to e6, a beautiful move. And now white has three options. He has bishop takes e6, bishop takes queen, and queen takes knight. So let's go over the, the worst one first. That is bishop takes bishop. This allows for a smothers mate in that queen to b5. Yes, white can block a couple times, but both those pieces will just be taken and it'll be the same exact position. So king g1, knight to e2. King f1, knight g3 check. If king e1, there is queen e2 mate. So king g1, queen f1, rook takes, and knight e2. That is a smothers mate on g1. King is sandwiched between two rooks and mated by just a knight. They are grandmasters, so we did not get that. He chose the second worst move, which is bishop takes queen, taking the bait. What he should have done was queen takes knight. Now, this pawn is pinned to the queen. The way to exploit that is to take the bishop. So we would get a simplified position that was similar to the first simplified position where black doesn't have a bishop pair, but he does have a bishop for a knight on an open board. White's pawn structure is even worse in this variation, blockaded and isolated pawns. And black is up a pawn with all the activity, 
much better for black. He kept avoiding um, options like this. So he took the bait, he took the queen, and now it becomes all about move order and precision, which again is what Fisher was best for. So bishop takes bishop check, king has to move, and now we get a windmill with the knight coming into e2. A lot of the times with a windmill, you know, you need to figure out the right orders, which pieces to take first with the checks. You can always make a, a favorable position for yourself by using this windmill. So he removes this pawn with check, and that is actually a huge pawn to remove. We'll discuss why. If, for example, the rook comes to d3, it looks like maybe white could get away with this. The pawn would then take the bishop with a tempo on the queen. The only way the queen can move to defend the rook would be something like queen c3. And then now all of a sudden knight takes knight is played with a discovery on the queen and the queen cannot move uh, or take the bishop, for example, because this mate would ensue. So beautiful stuff here. So we get king g1, knight back to e2, and now knight c3. Knight c3 is way better now that the d-pawn is removed because the bishop guards the knight. So you're able to play a lot of in-between moves that you weren't before because this knight is guarded on c3. So the king moves. We can get away with a takes b6. There is no queen takes knight. Queen has to move. And you don't want to take the rook right away. Uh, you want to because then they take the bishop and they have some piece count for everything. So rook to a4, and the coordination of all these pieces is absolutely astounding. Everything defends everything. You're creating a threat on the queen, so they cannot save the rook. So now we take the rook. We have a rook, two bishops, and a pawn for a queen, which is more than enough, and it's going to get even greater out from here. So white does not want to get checkmated, so he creates some rook for the king, or some room for the king, trying to get his rook into the game, and in doing so, black picks up two more pawns so the material advantage is even greater now white offers a trade if you're up so much material trades will only help a queen and a knight can do a lot less damage than a queen a knight and a rook so fisher trades we get check block takes and fisher just improves his pieces improving the coordination of all of his pieces on white's king we get knight to f3 and fisher is just like i'm going to improve all my pieces Queen b8, creating a threat on the b-pawn. Many ways to play here, many wins. c5 does guard the b7-pawn, but it does destabilize the bishop. b5 destabilizes nothing. Everything is super stable. Everything defends everything. That was Fisher's play style, just leaving absolutely no weaknesses in the position and then winning. He was super patient, uh, just a genius. h4, blockading h5. White has absolutely no play. He goes knight e5, trying to come up with some pins, some counterplay. Fisher activates his pins, dark squared bishop, by moving his king up, and now he has just an extra piece to play with. We get king g1, and funny enough, this move does indeed win a piece, but Fisher throws in the check. The reason you throw in the check is funny. It's because if king h2, we would get bishop d6, and now when the queen moves, this would come with check. So just absolute precision. King f1 is played and now there are many mates to be found fisher goes for knight to g3 king is stuck on the back rank forcing him this way and the bishops will then march over to the king side so king e1 we get bishop check bishop check knight check bringing all the pieces in and just the coordination is beautiful knight c3 check king has to go to c1 and now this is mate this is also mate and another mate he could have played, just because to show you there's so many, he could have even went rook e2, and then checkmated with the bishops like this. I guess he didn't go for this because he wanted all of his pieces to be used. So just a beautiful game. And this was the first glimpse of Fisher's genius in the chess world. I'm glad White did not resign. He played till checkmate. Nowadays, we would never get a game that plays until checkmate. So it's, it's, it's nice he allowed the brilliancies to unfold. I think that was my favorite part of this game. So comment below which one of your brilliancies was your favorite. In my opinion, the first brilliancy, Knight A4, was my favorite. Because I think it was the most under the radar brilliancy. I think the, the other two were pretty self-explanatory. I think Knight A4 was super under the radar and it catapulted this game 
into what is now known as the game of the century. So I hope you enjoyed, and yeah, let me know which one of your brilliancies was your favorite. Thank you.